afternoon, everyone. I'm Corinne Strykert. I'm the founder of iFective and host of the On Your Flight Today podcast. I'm honoured to be here to moderate this panel of indus with industry experts to talk about some hot topics in Wi-Fi. But what I'll do first of all is have each panellist introduce themselves and tell you a little about themselves and then we'll dive right into it. So, Tal? Hi, my name is Tal Calderon. I'm the head of uh, InFlight Entertainment and Connectivity, Unilal, the Israeli ally. Hi, my name is Eduardo. I'm director of customer care and product at uh, Tiad. So we run uh, the connectivity as well as part of the product. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Guillaume Vivet, vice president of airline proposition and experience for Viasat. Good afternoon. Uh, Mark Reed from the IFBL group, uh, director of business development. And John Wade, vice president of in-flight connectivity for Panasonic. Great. Okay. So thank you for joining us. So. For the next 45 minutes, what we'll do is we're going to have a conversation about Wi-Fi. So we know today's passengers want to be connected, and as a result, airlines are offering free connectivity and better in-seat power on board. So in order to like really deep dive into this topic, I thought, okay, how are we going to do this? And I thought, let's kind of chunk it down, and let's start with the airlines first, and let's understand the expectations of the passengers. And we have Tal and Eduardo. Uh, representing the airlines and I guess a question for both of you and to you know take turns in answering what do you feel are the expectations of pa your passengers and passengers in the region when it comes to connectivity just to elaborate on that what do they want for services features and pricing so can you give us some insight into what's happening at your airline in your region yeah um, I always say that the decision of free Wi-Fi, for example, or Wi-Fi in general, but especially on free Wi-Fi, is not the airline decision. It's the passenger decisions. And the passengers already decided that they would like to have the same experience or close as much as, much as possible the same experience that they have on ground. Meaning that the same experience that they have at the hotel, at the restaurant, at the airport, sometimes in the street, meaning free Wi-Fi, uh, even a connected stream that they can connect to their favorite uh, content, where no matter if it's Netflix, Spotify, or any other streaming websites, through the screens that are available from them, for them. And this is exactly the, the aim that we are going to. This is the, the direction that we are going to to try to reach. Uh, and in aviation, as in aviation, everything is much more complicated, much more expensive, much more everything. But we are almost there. We are on the way to free Wi-Fi. Not we. I'm talking about the aviation and the airlines itself. We already heard the Delta announcement. We already heard the uh, Emirates announcement, Turkish, whatever, and I believe that uh, all the other airlines, including Lal, will announce of some of free Wi-Fi. Uh, I don't think that there is another choice. I believe that uh, we will reach to that point in what, one year, two year, or even more. It depends on every airline. Now we need, we the airline, have to be very creative together with the connectivity provider and to find a way how to make it happen, because it is, as I said, it's expensive and it's complicated, but we all have those creative ways uh, to make it happen. Uh, again, just because the passenger expect to get this service. Okay, so you're being guided by your passengers and their demand for... I don't hear you. Oh, sorry. So you're being guided by your passengers and their desires for having that on-ground experience in the air. Okay, so Correct. Eduardo, are you having the same thoughts? Yeah, I think it's the same. I think um, it's the same, but with uh, with some differences that uh, that are important. I think we have basically three types of passengers that are using Wi-Fi. We have one type, of, uh, an additional type of passengers that are those that can get those hours to take some rest of the connectivity, and we have that passengers as well. They just want to be offline during the flights. Uh, it's not a question of of price or paying, it's a question, it's an option, mm -hmm. just to be, uh, just to t take some time to rest. But the other kind of person, I think we have people that are using just, just to communicate, to stay online, 
Uh, and we have launched Initiate Free Messaging uh, one month ago mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, and we have the second group of passengers that they want connectivity to work. This is the business uh, segment. And we have the third one that's the most complicated to handle. That's the entertainment segment. We see uh, a lot the Wi-Fi together with the IFE because it's, uh, it's something that we need to put uh, some resources available for the customer uh, to make him entertainment during seven hours, eight hours or 15 hours. So the, these things can work together. But, but I agree that uh, today it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, the experience people are expecting to be online as they are at home or at the hotels, but the solutions that we have now doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. uh, it technically doesn't allow that. The experience is absolutely different right now. Um, and, and I think people are able to pay, but not for so long. Uh, for free chatting, I think people are not uh, able to pay anymore. We are changing the market with that. For, uh, for surf, for, for that's what I'll call the package, but for regular internet access, people are able to pay, except for business class and first class. Mm -hmm. There they are not able to pay. They think that should be included as part of all the service that we are providing. So I think that the challenge now is how to give internet access to everybody in a, in a controlled cost or, found or, or could be funded for something else like <laughs> advertising uh, or something else that can allow us to do that mm -hmm. and allow people to, to have it. On the other hand, because we see it all together, I think Wi-Fi is competing with other kind of things. Uh, in Etihad, in Aerobody Fleet, we have Ebox. Ebox is just a server and people have access to content inside of the aircraft without connectivity. So that's another option in between that can help uh, following the, the principle of having people uh, entertain during seven or eight hours. Uh, it's another option to do that without connectivity because today is really expensive. Okay, interesting. So you said that um, you've just introduced free messaging about a month ago. Have you had any insight into how that's performing or is it still too soon to have it? any customer feedback? No, the customer feedback is great. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a pike on a, a really, really pe big peak on utilization. Mm -hmm. uh, people are using more, uh, are more satisfied in the surveys that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think th this is the right way. This is what people want. Okay. And, uh, and if now people can be satisfied with the free chat, uh, maybe in a few years or even months, they will demand for uh, total internet access. So this is the always on in the aircraft will become like a new normal, like we said in the pandemics or something. Okay. Uh, I think that that sh should be something that we, we need to think. But today, I, it's not possible to do it uh, from one day to the other. And I guess, Tal, are you offering, is LL offering any f elements of Wi-Fi for free, like the messaging or? Yeah, LL is offering uh, a free Wi-Fi to the premium passengers mm -hmm. uh, in most of the routes. And uh, yeah, we saw the difference immediately. And uh, there is, we cannot, you cannot compare the take rate when you are giving a free Wi-Fi or in a fee or for pay because it's something like, and there was a period, especially in the, in the, when we launched the service, we gave something like three months of free Wi-Fi for everyone. And the take-up rate is something like around 60 to 80%, which okay. is crazy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for the Israelis, it's not surprising because all of them are crazy to be connected. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it's, it reached to 60 to 80% when it's on pay, 9% is good, it's very good. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge difference between pay and free, of course, and it makes sense. Uh, and if you would like to use some advertisers or advertisements, I don't, I don't know any advertisers that will come to advertise in 9% take rate. 80%, 60%, 50% sounds much better for them. So uh, at the moment we are using we are giving it just off for premium, mm -hmm. but I believe that this is the beginning in in all the airlines. We are 
concentrate now in, in a specific audience, in specific travelers, but I believe that with the time, we will not have any other choice just to expand it. Okay, okay, interesting. So I guess, you know, I just want to confirm, so OL and Eddie have, have in-seat power, so I just want to kind of hand over to Mark here to talk about in-seat power, because um, you kind of need it to charge up your batteries or you're relying on the customer to bring their own to be able to take advantage of this Wi-Fi. So can you give us some insight into what's happening in that at the moment? Yeah, there's two, uh, obviously, systems uh, of thought out there. The, uh, the full service um, carriers will generally have a, a Panasonic IFE or similar. And very often, that's already built into the system. They don't need to worry about it. What we're seeing more is a growth with the LCCs and ULCCs. They're either having connectivity added to the aircraft, or they might have a portable server taken on, like a Blue Box server, the Blue Box WoW, which is very popular. And uh, maybe there's some monetization to be done through that. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we all suffer from this uh, new thing called battery anxiety. Um, yeah, That's we're all right. there, right? Um, you're all thinking about it now. And uh, it's... Uh, in order to monetize that, what, that content, uh, we, be it through advertising or selling content or selling uh, ancillary services, mm -hmm. um, many people will not use their device for any length of time because they're concerned about being at their destination, being able to use their portable devices, maybe for navigation or communication, whatever it is, it needs to be ready to go. Yeah. So that will deter some of them from actually using those systems. So you've got to have in-seat power, essentially. It, there's yeah. no option. It, it kind of goes without saying, I think, with the full service carriers. But you know, let's take yeah. a look at these low cost carriers. Yeah. I had a really interesting experience. There's one, I won't name them, I like to fly them. And if you follow me, you know who it is. Um, they offer Wi Fi, and when it does work, I get to use it, but I don't have the option to charge my phone. And you'd think uh -huh. I'd carry a portable charger, but sometimes I don't. Yeah. But I just thought, wow, why wouldn't you offer that? They kind of go together. So, my mm. question to you, more so in the low cost carrier market, yeah, are you seeing um, the low-cost carriers offering Wi-Fi, not offering power, or are they thinking, okay, these two do go together? Uh, from my own personal experience, other people might have a different experience. I'm seeing that the, the Wi-Fi is being put on first. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the portable units being put up. You get to sit near the front of the aircraft. Very often you can see them in one of the bins. Uh, others are fully connected, uh, but um, and some of them are now having, retrospectively, the... Um, the, the power is being fitted to the seat mm -hmm. because people are just the take up rate is too slow as we listen to the percentages of people taking these on a full service carrier. So, on the LCCs, probably a little bit lower if they cannot use their device and have it when they get to the end of the, their, uh, get yeah. to their destination. So, it has to be done. So, we're seeing personally, we're seeing huge demand for this going forward. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. Obviously, cost is a huge factor for the low cost carriers. Um, but what I thought was interesting, to be honest with you, as I was researching this, I came across one of your products that I thought kind of helps, could potentially help offset some of that cost. Can you kind of share with the group what you've got cooking? Okay, this sounds like a sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a system called, we call Ad Power, and it's a, it's a way to monetize USB or to at least get some of the cost back before you into this. The way we looked at doing this, there are various ways to sort of charge passengers for power. So we looked at what could be done within the airlines app. So we created a smart USB outlet that would essentially, when you connect your PED, it would launch the airline's uh, app and it could go directly to a page that maybe would have advertising, destination services, whatever it might be. And that becomes a sort of a chargeable commodity that the LCCs can use. It's, it's, it's like a virtual version of what you used to find in the seat backs before we didn't like to touch things and COVID and so on. So uh, again, you just get to use your PED. There's um, one scenario that's set up in it is uh, available configuration is uh, using the YouTube uh, idea whereby you watch a video, have a Coke and a smile, and then you get power maybe. Um, so, and there's a, a way to actually charge for that whereby you would either um, maybe pay for power before you board the aircraft on a checkbox while you're buying your seat and any, you know, your luggage and so on. That actually would load a token onto the airline's app that you paid for it. And the, your PD would actually send the command to switch it on. If you haven't paid for it, then you can't do it. But again, with a connected aircraft, if you got on, then decide you want power, there's various ways of, of making that transaction. Everything's offline now, so or can be used offline on aircraft. So we tried to look at all the pain points that there were uh, that the LCCs would find because they rely heavily on their ancillary revenue and putting 
in-seat power onto an aircraft is a big expense. So we have various sort of uh, some, uh, systems we've set up that actually show by if they're going to charge for this, their potential revenue, when they would be cost neutral on buying the system, and then they're into sort of profit uh, going forward. And once it's fitted, it's fitted. Yeah, I just yeah. thought it was interesting because that could potentially unlock free Wi-Fi in that kind of business Exactly, model. Yeah. yeah. Full service carriers, can be, if you started charging for power, I think there'd be riots and everything being a full service airline anywhere in the world. So I think I did see some opportunity there and um, because I do fly some and they don't have it. So I think, you know, that's something they should definitely look at. But, you know, when it comes to connectivity, we've got Guillaume and we've got John from, um, Guillaume from ISAT and uh, John from Panasonic in terms of service providers. So I guess, you know, free Wi-Fi, we all want it, um, and I will go through some statistics um, after this, but I guess, are you able to both give us some insight into, okay, your airline customers want free Wi-Fi, what can you do, what can you support? Do you see, what what is kind of the recommendations that you're making to your airlines about the best way to service the customers, to be able to manage the load, the expectations, um, can you give us some insight into that, say we'll start with Gia? Sure. But first, we do free free today, but it's very exciting to hear from, from Tal and, and Eduardo about the, the trends. The way we see it is every airline is different and they are on a journey um, to get to what we think is the end game, which will be free Wi-Fi. Uh, free Wi-Fi offered as are other amenities uh, on board. But as Tal, uh, you mentioned rightfully, we also know because we are a pioneer of, of free Wi-Fi that the take rates are, are extremely high, 60% uh, and above. So as we, we've rolled out free Wi-Fi with, with airline partners like, of course, Delta, Qantas, JetBlue, and, and Air New Zealand, we know that we need to solve the main pain points or the, the main outcomes for the airline, which is delivering the quality of, of, of experience. And the first thing in order to do that is capacity, capacity density, and coverage. It's not about delivering well on a couple of flights. For us, at scale, is delivering thousands of flights a day in very dense, dense areas, and that's what we do today, and that's what we're going to do moving forward. So we've planned our capacity, our network accordingly. So we have today uh, 19 satellites covering about 3,100 aircraft. We have 2,000 aircraft in backlog, so 10 satellites com coming up as well to be able to deliver those use cases, to be able to deliver that experience as it is on the ground, including video streaming, etc. But we've done, we've done pretty much everything from full free you know, to freemium, etc. And it's a journey and we're working very closely and hand in hand with our, our airline existing customer who want to transition to, to free Wi-Fi as well as our, our prospect airlines. So that's really on the capacity side. That's, that's the main technological barrier that we're working and we, we know we've solved already. Then it's about innovation. Uh, we know airlines need to offset some of the cost, of course. So we are offering digital platforms, an ecosystem of advertisers, partners, in order for the airline to first create a great digital engagement and digital experience with their passengers, but as well as being able to be in a position to offset some of the cost as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we think eventually, again, all airlines will, will get there. I think each, each airline will have its own path to get there. Yeah, uh, you know, everyone's got kind of, you know, it's different in every region and the demand, the expectations are different. Um, but uh, yeah, so it probably calls for somewhat of a customized solution. Yeah. yeah. John, would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, I very much broadly do. I mean, I've, I've been in the IFC space now since 1998. So it's been a 25 year journey from when you couldn't find an airplane with connectivity to now most airplanes have got connectivity. But to uh, echo what Graham was saying, capacity has been a problem for us as an industry. We haven't had the capacity there to do the things the airlines have wanted with the price points that they want to offer. But that is all about to change, you know, whether it's through Viasat 3s being launched or whether it's OneWeb or other massive constellations that are coming online. I think we're, for the next five years, going to be in the period of most explosive IFC growth that's happened in the history of IFC. So I think it's tremendously exciting. And to echo what you were just saying about offsetting the cost, it's what free Wi-Fi isn't free. Mm -hmm. Somebody is paying, yeah. whether that's the airline, whether it's the passenger, whether it's embedded in the ticket price, whether it's bundled in terms of your cellular uh, service plan. All those options, I think, are going to be available to airlines in terms of how they want to implement. And I think we'll see a variety of those models emerge over time. But streaming plus Wi-Fi is about to happen to the world's airlines. And I think by the end of this decade, 
it's going to look radically different from how it's looked for the first two decades. Okay. So I guess, you know, and that's something I'm hearing as well, you know, capacity, it's being worked on, it's going to be resolved, but what's the next big thing? And I'm leading into this because I had the pleasure of speaking with Neil Faulkner from Imasa a few weeks ago on, uh, on my podcast. And he really believes, and I kind of agree with him, it's all going to be about the quality of experience. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be critical because if you're giving a free service, you want it to work, right? I flew actually two weeks ago, I won't name them, and it was free, but the service didn't work. So as a customer, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm not going to complain because they kind of like throw me a freebie. On the next flight at work, but then I had that expectation, why can't I do this, why can't I do that? So I guess, you know, Guillaume and John, how do you feel about quality of experience? Do you agree uh, that that is going to be the big focus? And what are you guys doing to kind of work with the airlines to help them give that good experience to their customers? I think it's vital. Mm. I mean, uh, historically, as an industry, we tended to rely on a single metric, which is called SLA. Mm -hmm. But SLA is sort of meaningless in many ways. It just tells you whether your network's alive or not. Beyond that, there's a myriad of networks which are important. You know, things like the forward link utilization, reverse link latency, all those other things come into play. And we're very much a supporter of that. We're actually hosting the Seamless Alliance on our stand because we very much believe that uh, the future of IFC has got to be about delivering a consistent, high-quality experience. Uh, it's not something we've done well as an industry in the past, but I think it's going to be essential for us to do those sorts of things moving forward so that the passengers at the end of the day feel they've actually got a very good experience, regardless of whether they're paying for it or not. The, the expectation is going to be that it's close to the experience you have on the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's, it's a fundamentally important thing for uh, every IFC provider to embrace. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it, it's, it's paramount. If you think about an airline investing in free IFC, they have a rightful expectation that is going to drive CSAT and PS scores improvement. And we've seen in the past, uh, unfortunately, in the industry where it becomes the opposite. It becomes a delivery of a free experience <coughs> that creates detractors within your passenger base because it's not working, because it's slow, etc. So with all the, the customers we have, in particular the full free, and then the, the ones that are listed are just uber-focused on quality of experience, whether it's Delta, Airlines, Qantas, JetBlue, and, and Air New Zealand, it is paramount. It is part of the business case to deliver on the quality of experience to get to the CSAT number increase, the NPS score increase, etc. So it is part today of our KPIs. We measure it, we're getting better and better at doing it. And, and this is what we do, basically measuring quality of experience on top of all the usual network parameters that we've been doing for years. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, you know, to the airlines, obviously quality of experience being full service premium airlines, it is absolutely critical to your customers. I guess, have you had any feedback? I mean, you know, we're not in a perfect world, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, have you had any feedback and, and kind of how do you work with your partners to address quality of experience? Yeah, we have a kind of experience with, uh, with free Wi-Fi, as, as I said, because there was a period that we provide for a free Wi-Fi, and from time to time we are also uh, providing to uh, specific flights uh, free Wi-Fi. Uh, I must admit that we didn't, uh, we didn't experience critical issues because, and this is one of the reasons that we learned, it's almost like with the IFU, with the entertainment system, Everybody use it, but not everybody use it on the same time. Meaning that everybody can use free Wi-Fi to even to watch videos, but it will be half of the flight or even 40% or 30% will watch live video or any other stream video. And it's fine. We had a flight on the same time of the uh, World Cup, the Football World Cup, the final. We saw a flight of 150 passengers. Not all of them watched the final, but big part of them. And nobody has any issues to watch it and to have good quality of video. So it really depends which technology you are using. It really depends how many users you have on the same time. I know that technology is not yet on the, same, on the place that you can rely on it and to make sure that it will work without any issues. And we all know, and just from a brief around here uh, in discussion we, with the providers, all of them are working to provide the technology. We all know that it will, it will work. It will be there maybe in a year, two years, but at the moment, if you are using the, the correct technology and uh, in the right way, probably you will have good quality and the passenger will be 
uh, with very nice satisfaction. Uh, and this is the, fi the feedback that we got from the passengers when we, when we gave them and we allowed them free Wi-Fi and they use it. Uh, the quality was really good. Mm -hmm. Even now in, in technology and, and with all the issues around it. So we are quite confident that uh, uh, the interest in, is in the right way. And as, as I saw it this morning, it's really, it, it's going there. I think that the experience that we have now, it's not the same experience that we have at home or okay. we do to have here. That's the first part that the customers to understand. When we are doing this just for free chatting, it's perfect because it's really the same. Uh, and since you don't have connectivity problems like uh, drops during the flight, it works exactly like home. When you start to put uh, what you call the surf product, that you need speed and you need other kind of things, you can see a different experience today from the past, uh, from, the, from our homes. The second thing that could be a problem as well, it's the moment that Wi-Fi becomes available. In that moment, you have a peak of requests on the server trying to log on. And that could take a lot of time. Uh, could take two minutes, three minutes, whatever. So that's the, um, I think that's the, that are the two points today in the experience that are not similar. One of them that is the, the average speed of access, uh, it's not easy to solve uh, because uh, in the other, in one hand you have p all the technology getting better, but on the other hand you have each time more users. So uh, the broadband that the aircraft is able to do, it uh, has to be divided with much more users. I think as well that we, we, are, we are basing a lot our analysis in uh, customer experience and the feedback that customer gave us in the NPS survey. But I think we have a lot of data coming from the systems of the aircraft that can be useful as well. I think we are using a lot of information between the aircraft and the satellites. And I don't care about this one because this is gives always 99.999 whatever percent. What we need to know to understand the customer experience is the average, uh, the average speed access inside the aircraft, the drops inside the aircraft. So it's between the device and the aircraft. That's the most important for me now to, imagine, to, to measure and to manage uh, the customer experience with Wi-Fi. Yeah, I have to agree. You know, and when I think about my personal experiences, I know I've flown quite a bit and you know, I've had a great experience. The person next to me couldn't get connected. So it's That's so point, inconsistent yeah. in the cabin. And I think we're still seeing that. We've been seeing that for many years since I've been doing it. So I guess, you know, Guillaume and John, you know, how do you think that that's going to kind of evolve and, and improve? Like, so the person, you know, you're all getting the same kind of experience. For us, again, we measure a quality of experience today on, yeah. on most of our, our customers. The way we do it as well to do a true measurement is we have the load, that's natural load from the passenger, and we measure on top, right? And we measure the experience for that virtual user on top of all these, uh, these other passengers, which give us a proper view of the quality of experience on, on every single, single flight. Um, I totally agree as well. So there's the addressing the quality of experience, and then there's the friction in getting connected. We know in the industry as well, we have a lot of passengers get lost, they don't access the portal, they're not able to get on board. And it's also one area where we're focusing on a lot on the technology to get in the hands of the airlines the tools and the, again the technology that allows their customer to get connected seamless. And of course that revolves around Passpoint Hotspot 2.0 with a kind of automatic authentication where you don't have to think about it. You get on board and you connect based on the economics and the, the business case and the quality of experience that the airline has decided to do. So we measure it today. We have the capacity today, we'll have it even more tomorrow to get to the right economics. And we're looking at the kind of end user journey on board to make sure that they get to internet as fast as possible and there's no friction and we don't lose, you know, five, six percent of the passengers along the way. So everybody can connect. Okay. John, anything to add to that? It would be kind of hard to add to that actually. I think that was a very <laughs> comprehensive answer. Yeah. But I think, I, mean, I think it comes back to that old management mantra of what gets measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. And you've got to measure everything in terms of the passenger experience. Um, I had a very good conversation with a, a gentleman called Peter Lemmy, some of you might know who's part of the Seamless Alliance. 
and he and I had dinner one night and he started telling me, I think we need to measure this, 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 and this. And I was thinking, that's a lot of things to measure. But if you started to think about everything he was talking about, it was every single step of what's necessary to deliver an end-to-end -end network experience. So it is really down to the IFC providers to measure every single step of that and make sure that we're actually having those very high success rates in terms of connectivity and IP addressing and the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, but as this industry matures, we get the capacity into space, we get the uh, next generation of WAPs in the aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're just gonna see this inexorable improvement in, in passenger experience and affordability and the, and the uptake. So I think it's just gonna look very, very different for us in the next few years in terms of the experience passengers get, the consistency of it, and how many people are connecting. Yeah, and I, I think it can be quite complex, especially from an airline perspective, you know, the amount of metrics that probably come across your desk, <laughs> and then looking at that as well, that can be, can be quite complex, and I think that's something we need to be mindful of as well, not to kill ourselves with complexity and focus on the customer and the experience that they have. But um, I do hear the audience buzzing, so I think um, it's a few minutes uh, to go. I'll have anyone in the audience would like to ask a question of the panel. Becky, how's it in flight? Um, this might be a really specific question, and I don't know if you can actually answer it, but to give some, so recently I flew with my teenagers, who we knew we were going LCC, so we knew there wasn't gonna be any entertainment, you know, IFE and, and seat back or whatever, so they downloaded their movies, all happily. Um, we got on the flight, and to their horror, that absolute horror, there was no in-seat power. Um, to give some context for everybody, so maybe the airlines that are sitting here, can you give us an, an, a guide or an average of how much it would cost per seat to retrofit um, in-seat power? <laughs> Sorry. A little, very loaded question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Spotlight. Um, it, uh, it varies a great deal. There's everything from a single kind of USB-C, uh, sorry, USB-A low power that we've all been used to. We see it in our wall chargers and laptops and so on. They're generally fairly low power. Um, for the hardware alone, could be anything from 50K upwards. That's without certification. When you move into sort of higher power USB-C, people want to run um, tablets and, and laptops and so on. That, uh, there's, there's no limit to that, but there is a limit to what the aircraft can provide, and that's when you have to use a power balancing system. So, you know, everybody gets something, but some some units may not charge, but they may maintain. But it's a, it's it's a big hill for the LCCs to climb, especially some of the larger ones. They have a lot of aircraft to fit out. So this would be a lo long-term program. So maybe next year or the year after that air airline again, maybe they'll uh, have power for you. And hopefully it's from us. So no pound, dollar, euro figure being able to be banded, average? Uh, no, it, it say it's that just for the hardware alone. Um, it's going to be sort of 50K upwards just to buy the hardware. That's without installation and, and certification. And anyone who's had to deal with certification knows that that is a huge you know, sort of hoop of fire to drum, jump through. And rightly so, it needs to be safe. But um, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's not going to be low cost for them, unfortunately. Uh, slightly, um, oh, I'm Eleanor from In Flights magazine as well. Um, just adding to what Becky just introduced a second ago, um, how would an airline pick out their USB-C type? Because obviously passengers have a range of USB-C-A to USB-C, mm -hmm. yeah. and you can't exactly predict who's going to have an iPhone versus a Samsung. So how do you make the most logical choice that will get the best profitability? The first thing they do is look for me on LinkedIn, and then we'll start the conversation. But, uh, no, there are various, seriously, there, there are different options available. You can go to a low, fairly low power system that will just do phones and small laptops. When you get into the sort of small tablets, when you get into the sort of larger tablets and laptops, that's when they become power hungry. Now, USB-C can actually charge at the same rate as a standard USB-A, but passengers will be expecting more of it and disappointed when it can't deliver. It's like anything, whether we're looking at the connectivity, the bandwidth that we were talking about, people have an expectation. And you know, the airlines have to deliver that expectation. Your full service carrier, John's system at Panasonic, they have this expectation. So if it's there and it doesn't deliver, then it's a negative experience. It's almost as bad as it not being there at all. I had a question on uh, polar routes and uh, passenger experience. Have you guys seen any uh, 
uh, passenger experience, experience hits by not having coverage on polar routes? And uh, do you expect to take in that uh, with the Leo and Leos coming out? I didn't hear the question. No, it's about coverage, yeah. right? <laughs> Can you repeat on the but question? Because sorry, right? Is this better? Yeah. 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 <laughs> sorry. Um, with the uh, polar routes not being available for connectivity, have you guys seen a hit in passenger experience because of that? And do you see an uptake in passenger experience with the new MEO and LEO routes, or new MEO and LEO satellites providing that polar coverage? <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 coverage issue is we all know it's it's a issue that we are experience uh, day by day, and uh, um, we don't have any other choice just to wait until we have a full coverage, the global coverage, and to uh, provide it to our passengers. I think that. Uh, now the combination that in, uh, of Inmarsat and Viasat together will, uh, I hope, that will uh, we'll push it a bit, bit faster. But uh, from the other side, the technology and the combination between all the technologies, this is the issue that I hope and I believe that most of the uh, providers are working on it, how to combine all the technologies together. And we saw the hybrid issues and we saw the, the integration of Leo, Mio, Geo, and all the other uh, technologies because that the, the industry will cannot remain in the situation that we are having now, that we are facing now. We will have to find a solution. And I know that most of the providers are working on it, how to cover and to have get good coverage, combining all the technologies together or somehow it's a very complicated issue but we all know that we will have to be there and th this is exactly one of the reasons that we are moving from one provider to another and asking them where are you standing now what are you doing with the technology now because we saw so many solutions and we need to know exactly where we are going when where the industry is going and how we are going to uh, solve it and uh, of course that i believe that every airline will uh, demand it from their providers to provide them uh, answers and solution of this uh, a bit complicated issue. I'll just add to that. I think when it comes to passenger experience, it goes without saying that if you're offering a service and there's a disruption to it, whether it's polar or whether what I discovered is some parts of the US where it has to be switched off and all of that. So I think it goes without saying there is an impact to passenger experience. But what I found in you know, previous life, I spoke for an airline and, and did some other things, is that if you're communicating and educating them that, hey, this is coming, and I was on a recent flight and I kind of got that notification as a passenger just a few weeks ago, and I thought, thanks for letting me know. It wasn't polar, but there was some other reason for that outage. So I think you know, we can expect it, but education and communication, I think, is the key. Obviously, the technology is coming and that will be covered and it won't be an issue. I really feel, you know, if you're communicating to your customers through your portal, offering the correct messaging and stuff like that, then it should set that expectation because I think it's that gap between expectation and, and you know, marketing expectations where the complaints come in. And if you can narrow that down with your communications, I think that's a win. And we, we, we've, maybe if I can supplement a bit, we, we've seen that as a pain point from a lot of our customers, in particular East Coast US to Asia. Middle East to West Coast, etc. It's two to three hours outages, and it's a pain point clearly. And we've been working on it through our hybrid networks, Geo Heos, with two satellites that are going to launch by the end of this year, providing us ample capacity to give that total 100% coverage, including including above polar. So really removing that uh, that pain point for our customers from next year. But uh, but I agree that now it's a qu it's absolutely a question of communication. It's a question of communication in coverage in speed of access, in the power supplies, for example, because if you are having three kids, you have to know that you have to take three devices and three cables to connect, otherwise you will stay, um, you will, will run out the battery during the flight. So this brings us a lot of challenge in terms of communications to the customer to be 
prepared to the flight and after that to set their expectations to make the gap shorter between expectations and the service that you can deliver now. And this is important as well because we are managing customer services as well and we know the complaints that we have not just because of that but the worst of all are the complaints that you that someone mentioned i'm not sure if it was you people that are uh, that pay that are not able to access that's the worst complaint that you can manage and still happens uh, in the today still happens in some flights yeah um just a question you spoke about the path to free in-flight connectivity for the airlines. Um, what role do you see third-party partnerships playing in that, um, such as mobile network operators, streaming providers? I know you touched on advertising, so anything more on that would be appreciated. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I think the role of the mobile network operators is vital. I think it's absolutely key to all of this. Uh, we're seeing a number of mobile operators, mainly Timo in North America, really embracing connectivity. Um, it, it's the last piece where the global operators can't really stay in contact with their customers. And there's always going to be a discussion is, is between the airline and the, and the MNO as to who's providing that connectivity. But I think having a very broad-based environment where all the MNOs are enabled to offer connectivity on an airplane, I think is really key. But then to go beyond that in terms of the, your question about sponsorship, again, I think that's a really another important piece of this. Um, I don't quite know where it sits in the scale compared to the importance of MNOs, but we are very much used to the sort of freemium model. That's something you talked about it earlier, where you, you watch a little YouTube video at the beginning to sort of uh, get a service enabled. I think there's definitely room for that in the uh, onboard Wi-Fi experience. So I think those uh, IFC providers who are embracing both those paradigms will be the ones that provide the airlines with both optionality. And I think that'll be an advantage in terms of how it allows the airline to customize the IFC experience to what they want to offer inside their cabin. Uh, hello, my name is Angelus Mavridis. I work for Deutsche Telekom several years on IFC and also who was leading the IFC working group, the Wireless Broadband Alliance. Uh, now, I have a question. We used, uh, thinking always on user experience and went to seamless. Uh, I have the question now, particularly also to the gentleman from uh, El Al. Security is an important thing. And I remember years ago, we had the capture for security, to be sure. And uh, enabling seamless authentication, you can have some a uh, device in your baggage. Uh, how can we protect the uh, the airplane from bad guys? You know, protect the airplanes. It's a very wide uh, <laughs> issue, especially in Israel <laughs> and especially in El Al. But um, yeah, I don't think that we we did something. Uh, without involving our uh, uh, data security, security and uh, uh, the IT department. And uh, especially when it comes to, to the aircraft, uh, of course, that we did all the checks and all the tests that uh, the system is fully secured. And even now, when we are trying to improve it and to make, it, uh, and to make the service more accessible and more uh, valuable for the passengers, this is the first thing that we are checking, that first of all, that nobody will have an access to a places that he shouldn't have. And, uh, and I'm sure that all the airlines are doing the same. This is, not, uh, uh, this is not something that you can play with. This is the first thing that the airlines are checking, when you're, especially when it comes to connectivity and especially when it comes to the aircraft. Uh, we made all the things that it will be very secure. Of course, that I cannot provide you with, with the details, but, uh, but I, I can assure you that there is no any issue with it. Yeah. Great. OK, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panel. Really some great insights and sharing that with the group. And thank you for coming. And um, yeah, look forward to the next session. I Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.